Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Today, we have another Rotten Mango video. This is titled The Adopted Orphan Who Killed Her Siblings for Attention. The real life case of the movie, The Orphan. I have not seen The Orphan because I was actually too scared to watch it because when it came out, I was too scared to watch it. So we're going to watch the real story that's probably even more scary than the damn movie. So without further ado, let's about a boom and about a bang. Have you ever wanted to watch more videos than the thousands of ones that are already on my channel? Hell yeah. How'd you do that? Huh? Tell me. You know, like the ones that I can't show on YouTube? Uh, I, I got you. I have a Patreon with three tiers. This is what you will get per tier. Both of you like to read it. Honestly, I love it. We be going crazy on the Patreon, but I'm gonna let you be the judge of that. So y'all go ahead and check out the Patreon and let me know what you think. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for supporting and thank you for everything. Now, let's get back to the video. Bada bing, bada boom. What? Bada bing, bada boom. Okay, this sounds like a scene out of a horror movie, but it's mm. part of a real life case that just happened in the Philippines. December 10th, 2021. So this is pretty recent. 17 mm. year old Janice is hiding under her bed. There were three masked men that had broken into the family home. Oh, They're sure. going room to room, attacking anyone that they stumble across. Janice is hiding underneath her bed, literally a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Janice managed to slide under the bed, but she had no idea when the door to her room would open, when they would walk in, if they would even see her. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they would drag her out by her ankles. Jesus. She didn't make any noise. She, she can't make any noise. She obviously can't call the emergency service lines. Mm -hmm. She doesn't even want to talk. She's terrified. So she starts texting her family group chat, hoping her parents would read it and maybe they would send help. They would come to save her. Her parents are both at work. Oh. She's home with, alone with her two siblings. And she starts texting the group chat. Three masked men enter the house. They're attacking us. Please, please help. I can hear them screaming. They're hurting us. Please. That was at 2.48 p.m. Damn. Janice could hear her siblings scream They broke in at 2.48 And she was getting no response from her parents. Maybe they didn't see it yet. They were at work. So she didn't know what else to do or who else to turn to. I mean, think about it. Like, how quickly do your friends respond to your texts? So Not instead, fast. at 3 p.m., so just about... 12 minutes later, Janice, as quietly and as quickly as her sweaty fingers allow her to, she posts on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Guys, help me, please. Someone broke into the house. Help, please. I don't want to die. I'm here inside a room hiding right now. Please, please help. And then she heard footsteps approaching her door, oh, her shit. bedroom door. She didn't know if it was a parent, a police officer, or maybe it was the three masked men. Her father would later come home to find two of his three children dead. What the fuck? Okay, so where's the other one? Oh shit, bro. Rotten mango. As always, full show notes are available at RottenMangoPodcast.com. This case is pretty recent. Um, it's based in the Philippines, and a lot of the sources were a mix of Tagalog and English. I did get a Tagalog speaker to help translate and help with the research, but hey. of course, there are still things I think that can get lost in translation. If you guys know anything about this case that I didn't mention today, please let us know. And with that being said, let's get into the very, very strange case that everyone is comparing to a very specific Hollywood horror movie. Like one of the most iconic horror movies. I've because never this case seen is it. truly one of those instances where you think you're like, I know where this is going. And then it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Oh, God. So let's go back to December 10th, 2021. Okay. Really quick. Okay. Clearly, this is a crucial day. This is the day that Janice is hiding under her bed. And immediately, the beginning of the day was off to a memorable start, a good start. It was the first time that Janice called the McGuads, her parents, McGuad, Aww. Mr. and Mrs. McGuad, mom and dad. They were leaving for work. They were kissing the kids on the cheek, and she called them mom and dad. I mean, I'm sure they told her for a while now that she can call them whatever she feels comfortable with, but she finally called them mom and dad. That's a huge Aww. day for any adoptive parent. You you feel accepted? I You feel like you earn this child's trust. You earn Bro. the title. I imagine... Bro, you know what I just... I heard about this, and it said um, as a parent who has a kid they adopt... One thing that you never say is that, quotations, you can call me mom. 
Like you never say that. Like they said it's supposed to the kid is supposed to choose you and choose to see if like they want to call you mom or dad. I never knew that. And it makes a lot of sense because I would think if I was adopted, don't fucking say that to me. You know? You know what I'm saying? Like, what the hell? And Mr. McGuad, Cruz, his first name is Cruz, went to work just mm. smiling, like ear to ear, split grin. He just seemed really excited about this and about the family that he was working so hard for. Mm -hmm. So while he's at work, his coworker opens the door. He's a teacher, so opens the door to his classroom, pops his head in, and is like, don't freak out, Mr. McGuad. Don't panic, but your house has been ransacked. You need to go home now. Huh? Mr. McGuad panicked. He freaked out. What the fuck you mean, don't panic? Why is it? What? Why does that sound like such a, a Disney movie type of... He just popped his head in and said, don't panic. But your house has been broken into. What the fuck? Huh? Out. He runs out of the office. I think it took him about 15 minutes to get into his car, drive all the way home from the, the school. And there was no context given to him about what his coworker said. All he knew is that his house was ransacked How and his know three that? kids were at home. How did he know that? they were supposed to be at home. How did he know that? He's terrified. He can't care How less did, about the damn. Excuse me. How did he know that his house has been ransacked? How did he know? Because... Well, maybe there was a police report. How do you know this? House. He just needs to get home for his kids, okay? He forgot his house key in the hurry because when he jumps out of the car, he runs to the front door and he doesn't have the key. Fuck. He's shaking the handle. It's locked. He's pushing up against the door. It's still locked. It's not budging. So he decides, I got to try another door. He turns to leave the front door and he looks down because there's like a crunch underneath his feet. Y'all, if y'all need, if y'all are in this situation and you locked your keys and it's like very dire, I suggest you look up how to kick a door down. It's not as hard as you think. I'm not going to teach you here because you know why, but you should go look that up. It may be helpful. He realizes that at the front of the front door, just on the floor, is a blood soaked blanket and a knife. Oh. The handle of the knife was also missing. Huh? So he tries the blade part. Yeah, just, just the blade. blade? I imagine, and this is speculative, but I imagine that would happen if you were using the knife to do like very severe things uh -huh. for the handle to break off. Uh huh. There must be a lot of force applied in some yeah. sort of direction. I don't think anyone came in with just a knife blade. So he tries the front door again, and this time there's a stronger sense of you know panic and distress after what he saw. He's banging on the doors, shouting his kids' names, three kids, nothing. The door won't even budge. So he runs around the house to the back door, and he's still screaming his kids' names, like Gwen, Boy Boy, it's a nickname, Janice. And so he's running through around the house to the back. There wasn't even a single scream coming from inside the house. Oh, it no. was really quiet. He gets to the back oh, door, no. yanks it open. Thankfully, it's unlocked. And this is when Mr. McGuad realizes he's got to protect his kids. Okay, so, of course, any father wants to immediately run into the house and scream his kids' names and frantically just look for them, making sure that they're alive. No, 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 If I told my house, if I was told that my house is getting ransacked, one, I'm not, first off, I would hope that I'm not screaming my kid's name while I'm outside. The motherfuckers could be in there. I've gotten my house robbed a couple of times. They could still be in there. The first thing I'm doing is going to my weapons drawer if I'm in the house, I'm sneaking in that motherfucker and going to my weapons drawer where I know where it is quietly. And I'm going to make sure everything we're going to scope the scenery out and we're going to make sure everything is right. Or maybe I don't know if that's the best thing to do, but I would think trying to yell my kid's name is probably not the best thing. But still, he's like panicked. So it's like. There's an attacker. If they're maybe holding my kids hostage so that they can't scream and shout, I got to be quiet. Yeah. And maybe I can at least sneak up on the attacker. Exactly. That's what he's thinking. He's like, maybe I can knock them out. So as quietly Stab as possible, he starts tiptoeing through the kitchen. And the minute he steps into the living room, oh no! his entire life, at least how he knew it, just ended in that moment. The entire living room was painted red with blood god you couldn't damn. even see the floor that's how much blood there was huh? broken vases that were knocked over there were glass shards everywhere blankets were soaked in blood they were just thrown around even things that didn't belong in the kitchen like pans pots baseball pads they were just in the center of all of this and they were covered and soaked in blood the fuck? and in the middle were the 
bodies of two of his three children. Where's they the... had been murdered. What Whoever did this was clearly sick and deranged and angry. I mean, the injuries on the McGuad kids were really bad. One of them was even missing an ear. It had been severed off. How, what now, the one fu- of his uh, what? children did manage to survive. But they were incredibly distraught, obviously. They had been hiding under the bed when the attack took place, and they heard everything, every noise coming from downstairs. Mm. In what was supposed to be one of the best day of Cruz McGuad's life, it was now like a living nightmare. Mm. Every time he closed his eyes, all he would see are the two kids laying in the living room. Before we get into who survived, how it happened, I need to give you a breakdown of the McGuad family. Okay. And it starts with four McGuads. The two McGuad parents, Aww. Cruz and Lavella, and their now teenage kids, Gwyn and Louie. So it's the four of them. Until one day, Gwyn and Louie, they're both teenagers, they come home. And they're like, Mom, Dad, we got to talk to you about something. Mm-hmm. They sit their parents down, and in like the most professional, Shark Tank proposal, concise, calm, well thought out presentation, they're telling their parents why they need a fifth member of the family, why they <laughs> need to adopt Gwyn's best friend, Janice. Okay. It kind of sounds crazy. It's like, no, we're not just going to adopt your best friend so that you can have a never-ending sleepover. That's not how life works. But the kids <laughs> are like, Mom, hear me out. She's an orphan. She's been bouncing around from house to house. She is working as a live-in nanny right now, and she's never going to have a future like this. She hasn't even been able to go to school or study or have a childhood. She's constantly working. And then the minute that the family decides they don't need a nanny anymore, she's going to be out on the streets. I'm not going to lie to you. I probably would take her in. You know what I'm saying? Like, if she's like, if she's not like sketchy or anything, I would, I wouldn't be opposed for real. Hopefully, I'll be like, be able to like provide for this whole family because you know it is an extra mouth to feed plus more stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I had the funds, then it's fine. If they're cool, then it's fine. I probably fuck with her. You know what I'm saying? I, I'll get that. She's 17. She was forced to grow up when she was like five years old. Please, please, please. Can we just can we just let her move into our house? And she said that she would cook and clean and do the laundry and all of this. And we don't even have to pay her. She just wants to feel safe. A word? Please, 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 please. Parents are like, okay, wow, this is really intense. Do you know how old they, they are? The yes, Louis, the boy, is 16 and Gwen just turned 18. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So they're all, all right. teenagers, yeah. All uh, right. Like teen teens, yeah. And the parents are like, I don't know, guys. We don't even have a spare room. Oh, the 16 year old Louis, the boy is like, well, I could just sleep on the couch. Like, I'll give up my room. Wow. I mean, a 16 year old boy to give up his nice. room. That's very, very selfless. Yeah. He's it's like, come f- on, guys. Like you always told us we have to help our friends in need. Like, come on, mom, dad. They're begging and they're like, let us have a private conversation about this because this is a lot. And the few points that they keep coming back to as adults are Gwen's friend Janice was just a kid, you know, just like their kids. She deserves a fighting chance at life. They had seen her around and yeah, she looked miserable. Also in the Philippines, just like everywhere else in the world, when a young woman doesn't have the proper resources or support system, there there's a very real risk that they might end up on the street. And once that happens, it's very likely that she could potentially be forced into work or worse Mm -hmm. and even just the thought and threat of that looming over janice's head i mean as parents that's heartbreaking like this kid is growing up knowing that this could happen to her at any moment just like one choice from somebody else she has no control over her life no safety net the mcguad parents decide maybe we can take the burden off of janice she's just a kid she shouldn't have to worry about making sure that she has enough food and shelter So the McGuads are very religious. They thought, you know what? Maybe the Lord has blessed us with enough to provide for our family and a little bit more because maybe we were meant to provide for Janice. Look, the McGuads are incredible people. I mean, there are so many families with even more than what the McGuads had, and they probably wouldn't agree to this, (laughs) but they were just not normal people. So the McGuad family, they went from four to five members. They formally adopted Janice into the family, like legal papers and everything. So let's talk about each one of the family members. Mr. McGuad, Cruz, the father. He worked as an elementary school teacher, and it seemed like his career path was on the right track. He was spoken very highly of, constantly getting recognized for his good work. There was a promotion in the works, so he was doing well financially as well. Oh, sure, okay. And his wife, Novella, she was the principal at the same elementary school. Oh. So the two of them, they don't make like an insane amount of money. They're school teachers. They're a principal. But they were considered more privileged in their town. They owned land which is a huge deal. They're able to support their kids. They didn't have to choose between putting food on the table for the night or turning the lights on. A lot of families around them, unfortunately, had 
to make a choice between the two. Mm. Now, the two kids, Louis Maguad, nicknamed Boy Boy, Boy he's Boy. the youngest. He's the 16-year-old. He's like the charismatic one in the family. He's calm, but he has this like energy when you meet him. You're already spilling your life secrets, like your deepest fears, what you want to become one day. And you're like, why did I just tell this random boy that I just met all my deepest fears in life? Mm. I think he was just very warm and comforting. People felt inclined to open up to him when they saw him. He also never judged anyone. In fact, he would find a way to relate to you so that you don't feel alone or weird. So he's 16 at this point, And he tells his parents, I'm going to continue working hard at school. And I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a lawyer. This is a huge commitment to make at 16 years old. But he was, he was down for it. Okay, I don't know. Just reading about Louis, he seems like the type that I would be very intrigued by. Like, he's very smart, but he's also very creative. He plays the guitar. He likes to read and draw. So that's Louis, the youngest of the family. Boy, Louis. boy. His older sister's name is Gwen, and she was really the studious one, like the super smart one. Like, Louis is smart, but Gwen is intense. For example, she was a Girl Scout as a kid. And you know how they have those, like, sashes that they wear? Her <laughs> sash was filled oh, with batches shit. and pins. There wasn't even a single space left for an extra pin. She completed every level of the Girl Scouts program in her free time for basically for fun. And she's like, wow, I kind of need more challenge. <laughs> so in high school, she enrolls for this um, pre-med prep school at the local university for high schoolers. She's like, I'm going to grow up and be a doctor. So I don't know what the McGuads did, but they've raised their kids, right? Like one wants to be a lawyer, one wants to be a doctor, and they're both really upstanding moral kids. She also volunteered in her free time. Okay, I swear, she's like a college acceptance administrator's <laughs> dream candidate. <laughs> and yeah, I probably want her to be my doctor, okay? She's really approachable. If you happen to be at a gathering of any sort, like a party, you're feeling extra shy, uncomfortable. You're like, I don't know. A single person here, I'm so nervous. She would sit with you and keep you company the whole time. Okay, These are like, you know this how is some a, people will come? Bro, this is like the perfect family. What the fuck? Come and sit with you and they'll chat you up. But the minute that someone more interesting comes in or a friend of theirs comes in, they ditch you. They're like, okay, bye. Have a good one. That's fucked up. Gwen was not like that. She would sit there until you were comfortable. She would be there with you the whole freaking time. Aww. That's how she meets Janice her best friend, and now adopted sister. Okay. The Maguads are really well-liked, and they're constantly being invited to these social gatherings. Now, one of their close family friends had a live-in nanny that would tag along to all these dinners and parties and just kind of run after the family's kids. So she's a live-in nanny for one of the Maguads' family friends. Mm, so okay. she's brought to these parties on a working basis you know she's running around looking for the little kids that she's supposed to watch and there's a bunch of other teenagers there that are just teenagers like Gwen and Louie they're there because it's fun and it's a Saturday but she's working and mm -hmm. Gwen noticed her on more than one occasion mainly because you know Gwen's like she looks like my age she must be my age but wow this is she's working so Gwen strikes up a conversation with her, and they instantly click. Hey. Janice is a year younger. She's 17. Gwen just turned 18. And the two of them are, like, attached at the hip after the first time they start talking. Their favorite thing to do, this is, like, their go-to. Whenever Janice could get off work for a few hours, they would come up with these elaborate photo shoot sets. And they would, like, hang up sheets in the backyard and <laughs> do these fancy little backgrounds. They would set up the little string lights. They would try to time it with golden hour. And then they would do each other's makeup and hair. And they would spend hours just goofing around trying to take pictures of each other. Hey. They also really enjoyed filming TikToks together. Just of them dancing. It's really cute. It seems like they're really close friends. <laughs> they kind of look a little shy doing the dances, but Louis is really cute and charming. Okay, in a way that little brothers typically seem to be, he's like sticking his hairy leg out to block the girls when they're dancing and they're all like laughing and swatting his leg away. It so seems the three so perfect. of them, they look very comfortable with each other. So it's like once they're comfortable, Gwen feels like she can finally ask, you know? The question. The question, like. Why are you living nanny for this family? Like, you don't seem to enjoy it. Do you need to make money for your parents? Like, what's going on? You can tell me. Or if you don't want to, you don't have to tell me. Janice opens up and she says, well, I don't have parents. Oh. And she starts walking Gwen through her life story. And it's pretty heartbreaking. Janice said her first real memory started when she was like eight years old. Before that, she doesn't really remember much. She just remembers she's eight. And a stranger found her wandering around a ship by herself. Huh? Like a giant boat. Not even like a cruise. Like I'm talking like a sh shipping container boat. What her parents fuck? were nowhere to be found. 
I don't know. They may have lost her, but more likely Janice believes that they just completely abandoned her. Oh, my God. The stranger was nice and thankfully not a child predator because they helped post Janice's name and picture on Facebook. Okay, I don't know if that's a good idea, but you get it. And they were posting on online forums to see if her parents were looking for her. Uh huh. Nobody ever responded. Finally, Janice is dropped off at the Philippines version of CPS, the Department of Social Welfare and Development. We're just going to call it DWSD. <laughs> and uh, that's where Janice stayed. So she's bouncing around from home to home. And then recently, she was offered a job as a live-in nanny for this young family, and she took it. Okay, so she hates the job. She hates it. But don't get me wrong. She's so grateful for this opportunity. I mean, to have, like, a family take her in and let her live with them, that's a great job. You know, it's sad, though. She, like, gets to see these young kids live this amazing life with a family that care about her. Mm -hmm. She sees Gwen and all the teenagers at the gatherings being you know, teenagers, they have stress, but it's different. They have parents to comfort them. She told Gwen one of the things that she wished for the most growing up. She just wished that she could run around with kids. She w I'm not going to lie. This is this, Stephanie, you doing it again. She's setting this up so perfectly just to drop a bombshell of what the hell is about to happen. Like I literally, like, I don't know how it keeps happening, but I almost, I almost forgot about the intro that just happened. So it's like, Wish that when she was running around, she would fall down, scrape her knee, and she could just have a mom to run to that would hug her and Aww. put her on her lap and blow on her knee and tell her, it's okay, I got you. Oh, fuck. I mean, even now, Janice said she wished that all she had to worry about was getting good grades and getting accepted into college and not getting fired and being without a home and having nothing to fend for herself. So Gwen is really emotional when she hears Janice's story. I mean, for one, she had come to see Janice as her sister. So to hear about how hard her life was, I mean, it was rough. But another reason was, I'm sure it touched on the privilege that Gwen felt like she had to know that she was lucky enough that she could always depend on her parents to be there. Mm -hmm. So like, side note, Gwen's parents, they're not like free for all parents. They're but not when... showering her with amazing, luxurious items and like letting her do whatever she wants. <laughs> Just because they were doing okay, didn't mean that they were spoiling the kids. Right. Each member of their family, they had their own set of chores. Everyone had to pitch in. The kids had to study. They had to get good grades. Everyone had to be responsible. They had to go to church on Sundays. Like, there were a lot of rules. They were actually <laughs> pretty strict parents. Oh, shit. But Gwen and Louie had come to really respect their parents for that. They really were raised really, really well. Like, I think the fact that Gwen and Louie are even comfortable enough to ask their parents to adopt Janice, that just shows you how tight they are, how close. Like, that's actually crazy. Like, Imagine the conversation you probably had with your parents about wanting to get a pet. Imagine a whole human. <laughs> like. Close they are. So Janice moves in. She gets formally adopted, okay? Mm. She moves into Louis's room. He moves out. He's permanently on couch duty now. Couch and from duty. the moment, from the moment that Janice moves in, everyone treats her like family. Hey. They wanted her to feel like at home. Mm -hmm. They enrolled her in a school immediately. I mean, she had all this room to breathe now. Mm -hmm. She didn't wake up every single morning to worry about work and putting food on the table. She was just a kid. She said for the first time she had the luxury of daydreaming about her future. Oh, like shit. what her dreams That's are going to be. What sad. she wants to be when she grows up. She had never done that before. So after moving in, the three siblings, they get closer and closer. They kept doing their photo shoots, hanging out all the time. Janice <laughs> even went on vacation with the McGuad family for the first time. Oh, shit. So really close. Aww. Now, I do want to make it clear. Mm -hmm. Not everything was sunshine and rainbows. Uh. I'm sure any adoptive parent will tell you that it's freaking hard when a new child has to get accustomed to their like new environment. I appreciate you uh, giving me a reality check because this, this shit does kind of sound like it's sunshine and rainbows. I'm going to keep it a stack with you. Learn the rules and even just to trust the adoptive parents. It's a long process. There's this long, hard grace period you have to go through and it's completely normal for there to be hiccups along the way. You mm -hmm. just have to be open about it, right. which the McGuads were. I really do think that them being educators helped them in this whole process. They were always patient and understanding. Hmm. So Janice's first hiccup came a few months after her adoption. The McGuad family had land and um, a few pigs that they were raising on this land. So they have little pigsters. And Crew sold one of these pigs for about 200 US dollars. He takes a little cash. It's a bunch of small bills. He puts it in a little cash jar in the primary bedroom. She took it? That, Did she take out the cash I don't know. Maybe he'll need it for an emergency one day. The same month... His elderly parents test positive for COVID. Oh. Now, in the Philippines in 2021, there were these quarantine facilities that you have to go to. So at least in this area. So his parents, they're being quarantined in a government facility and they would need money for food and supplies while they were stuck in there. 
Cruz is like, okay, perfect. I knew that that, that $200 was going to come in handy. He runs to grab it from his little glass jar, and it's freaking empty. Oh, it's God. Gone. Oh, fuck. It's so weird. So he asks his wife, hey, babe, like, have you seen the money? Oh, She's no. Like, well, why would I touch the money? He asks his kids, and they're like, Janice? No, I haven't seen the freaking pig money. Like, I, why would I? Where, what? He's like, okay, well, do you guys know where it would be? Everyone's shrugging. They have no idea. They all start helping Cruz search for the missing money. Cruz even wondered if maybe thieves had gotten into the house to take the money. But that didn't make sense because nothing else was stolen. And usually someone was home, so wouldn't they have known? They also have these big dogs that bark like crazy at strangers. Mm. She's genuinely puzzled by this. It's an inside job. It's like, this is a case of missing money. This is mind-boggling to me. <laughs> the family look around for hours. You know, the family is doing well enough to feed the f- the kids and everyone. They're financially stable to a degree, but they don't just have a ton of extra money laying around. Also, it don't matter how much money niggas make. I'm, if I was missing $200, I'm going to get $200. I'm going to get 200 You crazy? <laughs> I'm going to need that 200 so Cruz really was counting on this $200 to give to his parents. He needed it. Yeah. They're doing everything. Couch cushions, under the refrigerator, under the stove. They're turning over what? all of the rugs. And one of the kids picks up Janice's backpack. <gasps> Not because they think it's in Janice's backpack, but to search the ground underneath Janice's backpack. And it fell backpack. out. It fell out. Her backpack was suspiciously heavy. Again, he had received small bills for the sale of the pig, including, I believe, like heavier coins, maybe. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just like two $100 bills. Oh. They're like, oh, that's weird because we're doing remote learning. We don't really have a lot of textbooks in our bags right now. Mm-hmm. So they thought, what the hell? Why is her backpack so heavy? Jing- but they didn't, they didn't accuse her. They just kind of glanced at Janice. And she saw the kid, her sibling, holding her backpack, and it was just the look of guilt was so clear on her face. Damn, clear as day. It, oh god! She confesses. Turns out Janice had a secret compartment that she made in her backpack. So <gasps> you know the bottom flap of your backpack, you open it up and you look inside, and you're like, "Oh, that's the bottom of the backpack." Yeah. Well, she undid what? the seam, created a little empty space between the fabric and the actual inner lining of the bottom of the backpack hid the cash in there, sewed it back on, basically creating a false bottom for her backpack. You smart-ass thief. Oh, my goodness. Very crafty. Crafty as hell. And this is why I'm like, I don't know if I can be a parent because it takes so much patience and understanding because I'd be like, why'd you do that? That's crazy. But Chris wasn't even angry. I mean, he was disappointed. He's human. And her new family, they all looked at her confused and disappointed. But Janice was breaking down. She's like, I'm so sorry. I don't even know why I did that. Like, I know you probably hate me now. It's awful. I'm so sorry for stealing from you. Please, like, I totally get it. If you want to kick me out of the house, if you want me gone. like, Nah, I- hold on. Nah, nah. It's fine. It's fine. You can still stay. It's just one little hiccup. But we not letting you around no more money no more. It's fine. Like, you, you can still stay. Like, we'll forgive you. You're just not finna be around no, no more. No more. That, no. What the fuck? You're not finna see where this money's going. Are you crazy? You over there making compartments in your bag? You was one of them smart motherfuckers. I get it if you never trust me again, but please, I'm just so sorry. I really don't know why I did that. The McGuards were hurt, but they also kind of understood. So Janice had grown yeah. up with nothing. She didn't have the security that the McGuad kids had grown up with. And side note, stealing is actually very common in families with recent adoptees, especially with money and food. It comes from the child's scarcity mindset. So, I mean, think about it. If you never know where your next meal or money for your next meal or even shoes or socks is coming from, and now you're suddenly in a place with an abundance of food, of course you're going to think, I should probably grab some more so I can save it for later when I inevitably need it again. I understand that. I do understand that. Like, I, I completely understand that, which is probably why I would be a little bit, um, you know, uh, just like, oh, no, it's fine. It's cool. But you're not you're not knowing where the uh, other money is. You got a lot of access to some things. How the hell you even get a seam ripper? Like, oh, my God. There's no way you're just going to take it for granted immediately and be like, this is my life now. Unlimited food. <laughs> These children truly believe. This family's going to let them go. They're going to face scarcity yeah, again, and they need to stock up. Yeah. I know it's messed up that she stole the money, but it's kind of heartbreaking when you think about the psychology of why an adopted child might steal from their new family. Mm-hmm. I so understand. Yeah, the McGuads were disappointed, but they got it. They understood. And it didn't matter to them because it's like when your kid makes a mistake, what do you do? There's I can under, I can understand that, but I, I, I would just like, I can understand like the conversation the two parents have. 
Because, you know, like, they were, pro- pro- they were like, reluctant. And, like, this is one strike. And, like, you would think, like, oh, this probably wouldn't be a bad strike. But, like, strikes add up if you keep letting the strikes add up. You know what I'm saying? Like, say, like, one of them was, like, I don't really want this kid in here. And the other kid, other uh, parent was, like, nah, we could, we can, like, we could do, do that and that. That's, like, an, a, that's a big I told you so moment. Not going to lie. Hmm. What would y'all do? What? Mm, what would y'all do? Would y'all keep him in in the in the in the house after strike one? Because like some people like thievery is kind of like big, like a big strike. But like it's like mm, you could probably understand. It's, it's a it's a sticky situation. I'm not going to steal your kid, and Janice is their kid. That's how they thought about it. Janice is our daughter. Of course, we're not going to turn our backs on her because she did something wrong. Mm. She just needs guidance. So after this little hiccup, the family focuses on rebuilding that trust. And it wasn't um, this, Janice, you made us lose our trust in you, so earn it back. It was more so the McGuads trying to comfort Janice to reaffirm in her belief that they're family now. And she never has to worry about food for as long as all of them live because she's family. After this incident, the family actually come out stronger than before, more bonded together. Gwen started tutoring Janice when everything went into remote learning. And December 10th of 2021, I hate remote learning. before the McGuad parents left for work, Janice turned to them and called them mom and dad. Aww. It was supposed to be a very, very, very good day. But there was a problem. Janice, their adopted daughter, whom they thought was legally categorized as an orphan, meaning without parents, when well, it turns out, Janice wasn't even an orphan. In fact, she was regularly communicating with her mom on Facebook. See, that's strike two. That's strike two. You know what? Like I said, the background check has to be very thorough. You know what I'm saying? It has to be a very thorough background check because, excuse me. What do you mean? I, th- I thought you were I thought you were found in a shipping container. What do you mean you have contact with your mother? I thought you didn't have one. I'm not gonna lie. Tang, get out of my bathroom. Hey. Get out of my bathroom. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna be honest, lying is really big. And lying on top of stealing. You got one more. You got one more. What Eddie Guerrero said in his uh, intro: "I lie, I cheat, and I steal." Motherfucker, hello. You cheating now too? Cause you have a mother. What? That's fucked up. So what the hell is going on here? See now, I feel like she just finna set him up. I kind of feel like that this was this was planned because. I kind of feel like this was planned because like like she said they were the affluent people in like the neighborhood or in the school. They probably was trying to devise a plan to try to get them knocked off or something so they can get some of that money. I don't know. I don't like what this is Back going. Back to the day of the murder. December 10th of 2021. I'm not sure how Cruz's coworker knew that the family home had been ransacked. Maybe he saw Janice's Facebook post or someone he knew had seen it. Huh. But Cruz rushes home, finds two of his children dead in the living room. He tries to check if there was anything, a small pulse or anything, but there was nothing. Hey, bro, what the fuck? See, this the... See, this the type shit, bro. Like, this is another another case of people just giving a heart and they getting fucked over. I hate that shit, bro. God damn. It said Cruz dropped to the ground and he cried out. He's religious. He cried out, Lord, why did you have to take both of them? Why do I have to lose both of them? God damn. Why? And then he collects himself as best as he can because he's still a father. He has to look for his third child. Mm. So he's scrambling and he's praying that he wouldn't stumble across another dead body. And he calls her name out and finally he hears like the creaking of a door. Like, you know, when you crack it open and he hears her voice and he screams Janice and he runs to her room and he's putting her his hands on her head and shoulders and arms. And he's frantically checking all over her to see if like she's hurt. She wasn't hurt, but she's dripping wet. And for a split second, he, he was panicked that it was blood. Why is she wet? But it wasn't. It was water. 
We're going to come back to this His detail. His clothing too? Her hair is like oh. soaking wet in water. He Why? Made sure that she was okay. Rushed them out. And he kept asking her, are you sure you're okay? Are you hurt? Where? Why is Hey, bro, this is like one of them backdoor situations, bro. Oh, my God. See, if y'all know, when people like backdoor somebody, that's when they go in and they get the house robbed. And then they act like they was hurt or disheveled or something. But the whole time they were like hiding. Or maybe they might get shot just to like sell it. It's one of them situations. Mm -mm. Oh, mm -mm, mm -mm. Is your hair wet? Are you sure it's not blood? Are you bleeding anywhere? You would Janice smell is it. like hyperventilating. She's explaining three men came into the house. They attacked Gwen and Boy Boy. She had enough time to run into her room. She hid under the bed. She was so terrified. The screams. Nah, wait a minute. How do you. How. How when when you when they found when no not even when they found the money when your sister was holding the bag up or your sibling was holding the bag up you instantly get regret but you don't instantly get regret regret if you got them two kid did, did your two siblings killed that's not really a that's um it, what we're so loud there were so many screams she was so scared she knew that she couldn't help her siblings and she didn't know what to do or how to even do it and then finally it went silent she didn't know what to do she was so stressed she was having a panic attack mm -hmm. so the only thing that she could think to do in the moment was take a bath take a bath take a bath yeah. okay so this whole bath thing is interesting but we're gonna come back to it okay isn't water not like loud when you take a bath see i would be asking questions at this point, we were going to have an interrogation because my children are dead. Why the fuck are you taking a bath and my children are dead? That doesn't make any sense. That's fucking stupid. That's stupid. That's dumb. It's just very odd because, you know, I know what you're thinking and I maybe we're on the same page. Let me know. But I feel like a bath is very vulnerable. Like when you're in a bath, you're naked and in a slippery, wet tub, yeah. defenseless. It just feels like the last thing you want to do in a situation where you're not, your environment doesn't feel secure. But again, I'm, uh, people grieve differently. They grieve. Well, how long have they been dead? I don't. I, 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 yeah, people grieve differently, but I, that's not anything in like a bingo card about about grief. I don't. I don't know. Uh, Respond to shock differently. Maybe she was in a state of shock where even her brain wasn't registering because, you know, our brains like to protect ourselves. Uh -huh. yeah, I, can't, I can't imagine, like, bath and shower, because even shower, like, you close your eyes, you're yeah. in the water, yeah, you're, like, you can't what? hear things well. And then you got to get the towel. Like, yeah. that's a horror. And also, they might, they could, they could come back. Like, there's, like, a lingering feeling that they could come back. The last thing, probably the last thing, is being ass naked in a shower or a bath. What the fuck? Excuse me? Or and then bath too. It's just not... Yeah. First off, I wasn't even thinking of that. I was thinking of when you turn the bath water on and at first... Well, that's just how my bath was growing up. I don't know about y'all baths. But when you turn that shower on, you the it's like the whole house knows a shower is finna happen. Or at least the whole floor, if you got floors, you rich or whatever. Yeah, none of that makes sense. And then the water filling up the tub is really loud typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it takes a while, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm so yeah. nervous. So Cruz comforts her. Imagine being nervous as fuck, having a panic attack. Nigga, imagine... Hey, bro, imagine being nervous, right? And you having a panic attack, and your brain not working, and you just standing you just standing at the bath. Because you have to wait for the bath. You just like this. And then you try to like fill the water if it's hot enough and you go back to that doesn't make any fucking sense. That doesn't make any sense. That makes no sense at all. Hell no. What the fuck? Hell no. Hell no. That don't make no damn sense. It's a lot of things that go into taking a bath. You don't just hop in the bitch. You gotta have like a lot no. 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 And honestly, he stayed strong for her because two of his children are dead. He keeps it together so that she doesn't break down further. Mm -hmm. He felt like she had already been through enough. Mrs. Magard Lavella arrives at the scene just after the police, and she sees Janice standing there, soaking wet. 
crying. She's still and what? she rushes up, she hugs her, and she's like, Oh my god, thank God you're okay. Are you all right? What happened? Where are Gwen and Boy Boy? Cruz was the one to tell her, tell his wife and the mother of his children that their two kids were dead. My question to y'all, and we're gonna have an honest conversation. I understand. I've never adopted a kid before. I've never been an adopted kid. So I don't really know too much about the psychology. And it might be fucked up to say. I know it's going to be fucked up to say. But real life trumps fucked up things that happen. And real feelings will trump like just what's right and what's wrong in terms of fields. Once again, I'm going back to the conversation of when they were deciding to have this child in this house and say they were reluctant. And this one fateful day, the two kids that you have are dead and the, the, and, and the, the adopted kid is the one that's alive. I, I just want to know, like, what would y'all feel? Like, how would, like, what, what would y'all, like, did that sense of, like, okay, both of my kids, even though, like, all three of your kids now, but both of my biological kids are gone, and I have this adoptive kid. Like, just, like, you just, so many thoughts just roaming around your mind. And it's, like, what the actual fuck? This is, I don't know, it's probably as fucked up to say, so I do apologize if it comes off offensive but it's like i don't know bro i can only imagine like so many thoughts are just running through my mind mrs mcgard lavella is an elementary school principal she was very loved for being this soft-spoken person when you're an elementary school principal you have to be calm collected you have to know what to do in the event of a crisis you have to know how to handle these things kids parents staff literally everyone trusted her to know what to do in every situation but in this situation, there's like no answer. Yeah, there's, there's no some situations. Solution. You, yeah. And it's said that Mrs. McGuad completely broke down in every sense of the word. No, for real. She's what a broken the fuck? woman and a broken mother. And I think Cruz, seeing his wife break down to the core like this, he had been holding it in for Janice. I think just seeing the devastation in his wife, he broke down. And so the three of them, they're outside the house crying in each other's arms and. The McGuad house was taped off as a crime scene. The police were really busy inside. They found like an abundance of evidence in the living room, just scattered everywhere. There were a few different things that could have been used as murder weapons. So there was, there was this bloody baseball bat, a hammer, a few kitchen knives, including the one near the front door, pans, pots, shattered glass what bottles. The fuck? And they had to log all the evidence, take it all in, and they tried to match the weapons with the injuries on the siblings. Gwen had been stabbed to death, and it seemed very personal. And we know this through all the cases that we've covered over the years, but when a killer stabs a person in the face, it's typically incredibly, incredibly personal. In the face? There is a level of hatred and cruelty, and oftentimes it can indicate that it comes from a place of jealousy. Like in that's the face? When you see that extensive injuries on the face. In the face? Oh, hell no. What? And her chest and abdomen, but a lot oh of God. wounds on her face, which you don't see necessarily in all stabbing cases. Yeah. So the chest and the abdomen and sometimes the back, those are pretty common areas. Yeah, because face is not to kill, right? It's face is just so personal. Mm -hmm. And again, to ruin someone's face, a lot of experts believe it stems from jealousy. Mm -hmm. So keep it in mind later. I can imagine. Gwen was stabbed multiple times just face chest abdomen she was missing an ear she had wounds all over her arms and hands indicating that she fought till her very last breath her hair was completely matted with dried blood mm. louis's body was just as bad the police counted 51 stab wounds on his body mm. let me repeat that 51 stab wounds on a 16 year old's body how can anyone ever hate a 16 year old so much to stab them i mean even once but 51 times, like, it doesn't make sense. Their bodies were so badly damaged, the morgue workers had to physically sew the teenagers back together before their parents could hold a funeral. The investigators that were looking into the case. Oh, 
Bro, what the fuck? Oh my god. Bro, this better not end the way I think it's going to end. Their initial working theory is that, okay, attackers came into the McGuad house since, you know, they're going off of Jan- Janice's statements as well as the evidence. Maybe the attackers, they were looking to target one of the better off families in the area. They most likely thought that the house was going to be empty, but they came across the three McGuad children and all hell broke loose. That was the running theory. That was the very initial theory. But when they're taking log of everything at the crime scene, just laying around in plain sight, there are so many objects of value. TVs, phones, laptops. I mean, if these are thieves that are willing to kill teenagers, innocent children, I feel like they would steal on their way out. Exactly. And it's not like they were hearing police sirens on their way. And also, if like it's a robbery gone wrong, I don't think they would stab somebody 51 times in the face. Both of them. I don't think I'd know. No, like, no, most of the times, if it's like a robbery, they they don't even intend to cause harm. Like if some people want to rob your house, they will probably brandish a gun or just have a gun on them just in case. But they don't pretty much intend to use it because when they're trying to rob the house, they're probably trying to do it when the person's not home. The gun is just on them just in case they have a gun. But. 51 time stabbing that's what the fuck so very quickly the angle of burglary gone wrong it was dropped yeah the next runner up as a theory was a family dispute over land so lavella had siblings and there have been reports oh prior that lavella and her siblings had gotten into these fights over land maybe some of the siblings were jealous enough to hurt the mcguads mm-hmm. maybe they thought that they could get the mcguads to hand over some land if their children were now dead But the evidence wasn't adding up with that either. I'm sure the police checked the alibis and the motives because in the end, they ruled that theory out too. So now they're out of options. The family, the public, they all want answers. I mean, this is terrifying to every single family in the area. I think whenever children are involved, it's a huge, huge deal. And like, don't even get me started on what's going on in the US. But, you know, when even children aren't safe... You feel like, what is wrong with society? Like, we need to do something drastic now. People are demanding answers and change. Mm -hmm. Like, they're in their homes. Yeah. So the police, they form a special investigations unit focused on this crime. And the mayor puts up a reward for $5,000 for anyone with information that would lead to the arrest of the attackers. Meanwhile, the police go back to the crime scene. They're like, we got to search through everything again. This is how we're going to break this case wide open. They bring in forensics teams. They're combing through the place. And I'm not sure why they didn't follow up with some of these leads to begin with, but they finally decide we got to search the perimeter of the house, not just inside the house, not just the living room, but like outside. And it's not just the backyard. They're going a little bit further than that. They're expanding their search scope. And that's when they come across this irrigation creek near the McGuad house. So it's it's like a small pond. Mm -hmm. And I guess since they weren't looking for a body or even a murder weapon, they just didn't think to search it until later. They got incredibly lucky. There in the creek was a little plastic bag. It felt like someone had tried to throw it down the creek and they assumed the water would carry it out. But the plastic bag got caught on a tree branch. Oh. So it's just stuck swaying in the water. They drag it out and inside are bloody clothes. The killers after the murder had taken the time to change their clothes, put it in a little plastic baggie, tie it up and throw it into the creek. Oh, okay, wow. Now they're getting somewhere. So with this in mind, they're feeling a boost of confidence. Okay, They start combing through the McGuad family house. Again, and they're searching for anything at all that might seem even remotely suspicious. It's always one little slip up. It's always one slip up. And that one slip up will just blow this shit wide open. Oh, my God. Meanwhile, the netizens, they're doing their own little investigation. And, you know, the police, they explored the burglary gone wrong theory, the land dispute theory. But there was one theory that nobody really wanted to be the first to say. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it just feels almost politically incorrect. It feels wrong. It feels cancelable to be like, mm, we think the survivor did it. Like, even just saying that, that's crazy, right? I mean, no, normal- no, no, it's not crazy. Unless this, unless, unless the survivor is like helping out with the case. From what was here, it, what was being told here, she hasn't said, or I don't recall her saying that janice was talking about what happened in in depth 
like, like, am I, like, if I'm tripping, just let me know. Like, if this is politically incorrect, I mean, it, she probably she killed the motherfucker. So shit. I mean, yeah. But it's like, I know they're going through trauma, or they might seem like they're going through trauma. But why are y'all doing everything and not checking the sole person who was in the? I'm sure. I'm sure they did an interrogation, or just they just asked what was going on, and she just like, just like, didn't even come up on her radar. I, I just assumed that because this seems kind of like why have y'all not? Why like what? I'm like, don't say it then. If you think you're gonna get canceled, don't say it because you're probably like, don't come up with these theories. Wait, did people think of that right away? Yeah, like netizens were like. Mm. I don't really want to say it. They're trying to like come up with roundabout ways of being like, well, there's a few parts. Nobody wants to be like, I think the survivor killed them. The netizens did have some strong points though. And normally I'm against these types of theories because more often than not, they're not true and it just ends up hurting the survivor even more. But I'm going to walk you through some of the biggest points of contention. Point one, the freaking bath. Yeah, like the what bath. the fuck? Okay, like, just- yeah, I just forgot about the, I forgot about the bath. Like, bro, what? How are you taking a bath? Like, I don't know. Like, yo, like, that, I'm so, con- ooh, y'all probably gonna think I'm fucked up. I don't know. I'm just, I've never heard of no shit like that before. I never heard no shit like that before. Like, oh my God, I don't. This is the weirdest part. This is the part in the case where immediately my little radars are going off. Like, it's, it's very strange. When Cruz, the father, found her in her room after he found his two children murdered in the living room, He was just so happy that she was alive. Mm -hmm. He was so happy that she wasn't injured. But she's soaking wet. Yeah. And she explains to him, once the screams of her siblings stopped, she took a bath because she was so nervous. Again, what an oddly vulnerable position to put yourself in when there were just three homicidal attackers in your home. I think that's even a nightmare to most people. Being in a bath when intruders break in. Nigga, I be, bro, I be so, sometimes I be getting that, 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 lump in my stomach when i'm taking a shower and 10 fuck around and knock something over i'd be like oh this oh okay well i need well i need to get out of this bath dry off find a way to get to the knife to my knife drawer or my web my thing thing and and uh and uh get get up on a nigga if i had to get up on a nigga what the fuck was that you don't you not hurting my dog no nigga like that's what be going through my mind like, bro, you just took a bath and niggas just killed your siblings? Like, what? I don't, what? You just don't feel yeah. safe and secured. That's why when you're, like, showering, you're trying to open your eyes and you're like, I gotta keep looking. Even Cruz said, when I heard that and when the shock of my kids passing wore off, I just couldn't stop thinking about that part. He didn't want to, but he couldn't help but wonder, like... Why? Like, wouldn't a more natural reaction to be either run to your siblings' bodies, keep hiding under the uh, the bed until someone found you, mm-hmm. or maybe even run out of the house? Netizen speculated. Wait, in a wait, ra- wait, 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 hold on. Very ra- so, wait, hold on, wait a minute. I don't remember what she said, but she was hiding under the bed. So, I'm guessing supposedly she was supposed to be hiding under the bed while the attackers were in there. But she took a bath. And when the father came, she came from under the bed while she was soaking wet. So 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 she was hiding under the bed, took a bath, then went back to under the bed. Hmm. What? Roundabout way initially that she took a shower to get all the blood off of her after she stabbed her siblings. And again, Louis was stabbed 51 times. That's just on his body. That's not including the injuries on Gwyn's. Another point of contention was the fact that Janice didn't come downstairs when she heard Cruz yelling their names. The house isn't massive, and from where her bedroom was, I mean, she could hear him banging on the front door, screaming the kids' names, running around to the back of the house. She didn't even scream back. She didn't alert him that she was in the house. Nothing. She stayed hidden, and she didn't come out until she heard him come across his children's bodies in the living room. But there's bigger... Okay, that second one, that second one, I can understand why she didn't come out if she just heard the name because the guys probably are still in there and she don't want to come out and just fuck her whole situation up. But now that she said she came out the, the room or out from under the bed after the, after Cruz found the bodies, this, 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 is, this is suspicious. Points to be made. The third point is the room that Janice hid in was ransacked. 
she said the attackers entered the room and they just didn't see her hiding under the bed and they ransacked her entire room. I'm not going to lie to you because we are in almost in 2024. You got to be the most laziest, dumbest criminal or you just trying to get the fuck in there, get the fuck out of there. If you go into a room that you're trying to get shit out of, or if you're going into a room to check to see if people are there and you don't check under the bed. However, there's two like I'm trying to think of these theories because if if the people break in know that there's an affluent family, I'm pretty sure they would know that Janice is adopted. And if these intruders kill two people, you would think there would be one more person in the house. Because if you were trying to rob a house, usually what people do when they're trying to get up in somebody's house, they'll scope the scenery out for a, like a month or just like look at what's been going on. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just it's just like. This is. Mm. I don't know. It's just kind of weird. This is weird. And the house really isn't that big. So if she ran away when the attackers were already inside the house, wouldn't at least one of the three attackers had seen her run to her room? And mm -hmm. one of the first places you would check is underneath the bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they just go into her room, ransack the room, and think, you know what? Eh, I'm sure she's not going to tell anyone what happened. It's weird. Also, she stated that she locked herself in the room and then hid under the bed. If the door was locked from the inside, how did the room get turned inside out? Well, they probably busted There were the also door. droplets of blood that were inside of her room. And so she's arguing, yeah, because the attackers came into the room and ransacked the place. Of course, there's going to be droplets of blood because they were probably covered in blood. Because look at how graphic the crime scene is. Mm -hmm. But it just wasn't making any sense. It's like, it's like three weirds in one. I can handle one weird, like the bad thing. I can handle one weird. But it's two weirds. Then it's three weirds. That's three weirds. That's too many weirds. Then the last point of contention was Janice sent the message to her family group chat at 2.48 p.m. Remember? Uh -huh. After the autopsy, police discovered that the McGuad siblings' time of death was closer to 2 p.m. So what happened during those 50 minutes? The fucking bath. This next one is a bit more speculative, but I'm still going to go over it. A lot of netizens were wondering how she was able to post a Facebook like post spelled 100% correctly and including emojis. So the Condolence, Ed, and Boy Boy. Why do you have emojis? Facebook post begging for help because there were intruders in the house. That post included emojis. Don't you got to find these emojis? Just kind of strange. And on top of that, just a few minutes after posting on Facebook, she changed the last name to her profile to P, P-E-E. -E. We don't know what P is. Her birth last name is Sibiel, and her adoptive last name is Maguad. I don't know what P? Janice P is. Wait, so after she made a post, she changed her last name? Yeah. So you're telling me you're hiding under the bed and there's three knife-wielding attackers downstairs murdering your siblings. And you're like, I need to update my Facebook name. Like, right now. I wonder, um, okay, this is, again, speculation time. But maybe in her 17-year-old mind, she thought that if her name wasn't Janice Maguad, the police couldn't find her profile. So, like, I think maybe she thinks the police are going to go and be like, oh, you know what? Let me just investigate this whole family. And, okay, Janice McGuad types it in Facebook. There's no Janice McGuad. Was it Jan Janice McGuad yes, before? Yeah. Oh, okay. She's trying to hide her name. I mean, that's Facebook. all they can think of in a 17-year-old's head. Because, obviously, they're going to find you regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I'm trying to think like a 17-year-old because it's so random. For now, these are just netizen theories and arguments. Meanwhile, the police would find droplets of blood in rooms of the house that just didn't make sense. Like the laundry room. There were droplets of blood there. But the laundry room shows no sign of struggle or anything. So the killers just like walked in there, spattered some blood around from their clothes, and then walked out. They could have checked. Now, the police believe that they do an exhaustive search of the house and the crime scene tape comes down. And the McGuads were allowed back into their home to clean and tidy up. And I guess figure out what they wanted to do with the place. Mrs. McGuad felt like a zombie in this house. Mm -hmm. So while the police were investigating, all she did was cry and grieve and scream and then crawl up in a ball and then wait for the wave of emotions to hit again. And now she's back in the house. She's like, I just want to stay busy so that these floodgates don't open. 
She starts tidying up the areas and she starts with Janice's room. It's been ransacked. So this is Louis's old room. Mrs. McGuad starts going through and cleaning up and she stumbles across an ID. She's never seen this ID before. It doesn't belong to her children. She rushes to hand it over to the police, and since the ID belonged to a 17-year-old male, his name has not been identified uh, to the press, but he's often referred to as Marlon, which is a pseudonym. Lavella did not know Marlon. She had never seen Marlon, Marlon before in her entire life, so why is his ID in her house? Her neighbors had seen him before, though. The day of the murders, a few eyewitnesses came forward to say that they saw Marlon heading towards the McGuad residence. And it wasn't just neighbors. A store owner that was asked said Marlon came in and asked him which house belonged to the McGuads. <gasps> a motorcycle driver said that he even drove Marlon to the McGuad house that day. What? So the police, they finally have their first big lead. And since Who Marlon's ID was found Marlin? in Janice's room, they bring her in and they start questioning her. And when I say questioning, I mean that in the lightest sense possible. They're not interrogating her. They're just like, hey, we found this ID in your room. Do you recognize it? Like, do you know who this person Do you know who this person is? Wait, are they suspecting her at this no. point? No. Oh, okay. They're just like, oh, like we found this in your room. Maybe it's Louise. Like maybe Louis had a friend, but we just want to hmm. know if you know. Just simply asking questions. And she's like, yeah, I know that person. They're kind of taken aback. I don't think that was the answer that they were expecting. They're hmm. like, oh, you, you know this guy? <laughs> yeah, I know him. And she breaks down. What? And she says, I had something to do with the murders. So, so she's able to do some crazy shit, but she won't break down until you just in, until you just show her that you might ask her a question. Like, huh? In that interrogation room, in the presence of a lawyer, Janice admits that she and one other accomplice were the ones that murdered the McGuad siblings. Look, the admission itself was never released. All we know is that she admitted to it, but we don't know how active of a role it. she took. We don't know if she participated in the physical killing. I think most people suspect that she absolutely did, but we don't even know who her accomplice was beyond the fact that everyone calls him Marlon. Who the fuck and that's is not even like a nickname. That's just an online pseudonym for him. But is he caught though? Yeah. So oh. her oh. and the 17 year old, they're both caught. We know that he's 17. He works for the church. He worked as um, the person that sets up the church hall before service begins. And that's really the extent of what we know about him. We don't even know how the two met, the fuck? what kind of relationship that they had. Netizens suspect that they were dating, which normally that sounds like a good theory, right? But it's weird because Janice's Facebook, she had pictures with another guy that she would refer to as her boyfriend, and it's not Marlon, apparently. Speaking of Janice's boyfriend, the police were able to track him down. They question him, make sure that he's not involved somehow. He wasn't. But he did say something that struck me as really weird, really interesting. He said that he saw Janice's Facebook post that day of her freaking out that there were intruders in the house. He saw it. He called her. She actually picked up the phone. But she didn't answer. She didn't respond. It was just like silent on the other line. He didn't hear any strange noises or anything like that. So after a few seconds of silence, he just hung up. Mm -hmm. He assumed that nothing really bad was happening. Like maybe she was being dramatic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was odd to me. It strikes me as so strange. Either this guy is a really boyfriend, the world's worst boyfriend, or maybe Janice has a history of making bizarre claims. Yeah, I, I, like, I, I just assume that. I, I assume like this is just some shit that she does or something. I don't know. What? Being dramatic. Like it's... It's just really strange behavior. I wouldn't say she's like the worst boyfriend. Well, he's the worst boyfriend because she used emojis in her thing. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Like this. What? I can't imagine a world where your loved one or anyone posts like that on social media. And you're just like, oh, well, it was silent when I called them. They're probably fine. You're going to say hello? Unless it's frequent. I don't know. The police immediately tracked down Marlon. They find out that he has a record. He was caught with illegal drugs not too long ago. Oh, shit. And there wasn't even a chance to deny his connection with the McGuad murders because they found Gwyn's phone in his bag when they arrested him. Now, this is where the case starts getting really, really strange. So at first, this was looking like a final girl situation, which if you guys know the final girl trope, it, it's a trope in slasher movies, horror movies, where one final girl at the end survives and she either confronts the killer or she lives to tell the tale. So a lot of people thought that this was like a final girl situation. Mm -hmm. But it went from that to being compared to the movie Orphan. Do you know which one I'm talking about? 
It's about this husband and wife who adopt a nine-year-old girl after they lose their baby. But the nine-year-old turns out to be a 33-year-old woman who is just hell-bent on killing the entire family. The fuck? Side note, I know the movie Orphan was very controversial. A lot of adoption groups hated the depiction of murderous adoptees. And I think that there was even speculations that it affected adoption numbers for like a year or two. I don't think I can really give input on that or anything involving adoption because... I don't know. I guess I was always in the belief that adoption is really good. But then recently I was seeing TikToks of adoptees saying that they feel a lot of resentment towards adoption centers and groups oh. and their adoptive parents. And I'm like, OK, I heard some stuff. I about know that. nothing about this world to say anything. But this case has been compared to the real life orphan. Hey, if you all have you all seen the show Atlanta? There's a there's an episode of Atlanta where this kid gets taken from CPS and he ends up at this um these white people's houses. I guess he got adopted and it it a lot of shit happened. Uh, if y'all want to watch it, trigger warning. There's some uh self deletion in this. I think it was a, a about like an actual story about some shit that happened. So yeah. And I just want to put a disclaimer. Just like any other case, there's bad people everywhere. Like, you're going to take a group of people, you're playing a numbers game. There's going to be an evil man, an evil woman, an evil adoptee, an evil religious leader, an evil politician. They're all kind of evil in that little area, but you know what I mean. So don't take this case or any case as like, oh, this is why I'm scared of these people or these situations. So anyway, people pointed out the similarities between this case and the movie. Both girls were adopted by a family that was kind-hearted, financially stable. Both girls disguised their hatred and jealousy with like this super fake, sweet facade. Mm. But the similarities kind of end there. Janice is not an adult. Janice was a minor when she committed those crimes. So she was a child who killed two other children just so that she could be the only child left. Is that it? That's it? That's the theory. We're going to get to it. What? So, I mean, again, I do see why people keep comparing the two cases. It's human nature to draw these connections. But I will say, unlike the movie, Gwen and Louis were very real. Like, these are real people. So the Maguads thought Janice was a troubled orphan, looking for a chance at a better future, right? That's what they thought. But she wasn't even an orphan. Her parents weren't dead. They didn't abandon her. They weren't gone. In fact, she was still in contact with her mom at the point that she was adopted by the Maguads. Okay, Janice was born to a pretty rough environment, though. That much was true. Her parents, Michelle and Juanito, they didn't have much. Most of their meals growing up as a family consisted of just eating sweet potatoes, not even three times a day, like maybe once every four days just to feel full. Sometimes they would eat sweet potato leaves if they didn't have any more sweet potatoes left, or they would ask their neighbors and beg them for rice or eat almost rotten bananas. So Janice did not have a normal childhood. She was never carefree. Her dad was always getting drunk and upset that they didn't have money. And Janice was found on a boat in 2013. Now, it's hard to say if she was abandoned, like she claims, or if she left her family willingly. But she's found on the boat. She lies about not having parents. Maybe she was embarrassed. Maybe her parents were dead to her after everything that happened. I don't know. I think this part we can sympathize with, right? Like her childhood. And maybe even the fact that she lied to everyone about her parents abandoning her. In a way, maybe she did feel abandoned by them. Either way. It's speculated that she just wanted to be taken in by the Maguads. But all this trauma, all this hurt started resurfacing when she saw how loving the Maguad family was. She saw how they doted on Gwyn and Louis and they protected their kids and loved them and helped them grow into good people. And Gwyn was beautiful, smart, kind. And it's suspected by netizens that Gwyn was everything that Janice wanted to be. And so the more comfortable that Janice got with the privilege that the Maguad family could give her, the less content she was getting. The Maguads were loving, but they were strict. So when Janice was adopted, she got her own house duties and chores, just like Gwen and Louie had. And this isn't some like Cinderella situation where they're giving her all this work and they're like, you're the adopted kid, you better do it all. The Maguads were fair. The problem though was Janice was used to living by her own rules now. She just wanted all the positives of living with the Maguads. Mm. She didn't really care for the negative parts. She also saw how much the Maguad parents adored Gwen and Louie and she didn't like that. But the crazy thing is, they gave Janice the same love. Like, from the minute that they adopted her, Janice was treated like a member of the family, to an extent where people around them thought that Janice was a cousin that they had taken in. But Hmm. Janice was not content. She just wanted all of it. That's fucked up. Mr. McGuad thinks that's That's the reason his children are dead. He said, based on her confession, she was jealous and envious, and she hated our daughter Gwen because of the love we showered her with. But the netizens are confused because even if... She saw all the love Gwen is getting. 
She also has love. Yeah, like, love like is what? not a finite resource. How can someone be greedy enough for something like parental affection to kill their siblings? Yeah, I'm over here trying to just think, like, maybe the... But no, what the fuck? What? What? To add weight to the theory of this motive, remember how she called the McGuad parents mom and dad for the first time the morning of the murders? Mm-hmm. Now, in hindsight, that could allude to her jealousy and her belief that she would soon be their only daughter. Mm. I don't know how I feel about that one. That one's kind of fucking me up. I'm not gonna lie. You conniving bitch. What the hell? What the yeah. fuck, bro? And I think it's the feeling of maybe Janice felt like she could never compete with Gwen and Louis because these are the birth kids, and so maybe she felt like the only way to truly be their daughter was to get rid of the birth kids. You don't think that they would probably just keep thinking about the birth kids? Like you, you ain't ever really think about that, Janice. So Janice admitted to being involved in the murders. And the theory of why she did it is still being debated. But I feel like up until this point, even for the McGuads, it felt, okay, it doesn't feel excusable or even understandable. But from a psychological standpoint, it seemed, like, you know what I mean? It, it kind of made sense psychologically. Mm-hmm. Not in the sense that any murder makes sense like all murders are senseless but i guess psychologically speaking everyone was like i think i can connect the dots i think i see where this is going Mm -hmm. everyone's like oh she's feeling this intense jealousy never having loving parents she wants all the love to herself she's intensely jealous this is the only way to not be in competition with the birth kids she gets them out of the picture that's what we thought and then the police find text messages in her phone they're in Tagalog, but they've been loosely translated to English. The identity of the person she's texting has not not been released, but we can kind of assume that it's Marlon. In the text, Janice says, There are seven people I want to kill. I won't tell you who they are now because you might report me. Seven. But this is all I have left to do before I can finally get the freedom I want. He texted back, Don't do it yet. Think about it first, then do it when you learn how to. Hell no. They both no. laugh, and she texts him back, I think I can do it now. Tell me, do you think anyone would still take me or accept me if I ever do kill someone? Isn't there a saying that no matter how big your sins are, even if you killed someone, the Lord will still forgive you? You just have to ask for it, right? You gotta work for that shit too, stupid. Hell, I mean, even soldiers kill people, so I should be allowed to. Soldiers aren't excused from the Ten Commandments. What the fuck? You're crazy, Janice. But for me, it's okay because I have someone special who will still love and accept me even if I do end up killing someone. Janice says, I'm being serious. I want to be a Marine. Yeah, she wanted to be a Marine, okay? And he says, soldiers don't kill people who wouldn't kill them first. I just want to finally be happy and do what makes me happy. Same. I want to not worry about the people around me anymore. Janice gets upset and she says, whatever. If you don't want to do it with me, then I'll just find someone else who will. I just can't take my surroundings anymore. It's not healthy for me. Hmm. Same. Ha ha. Don't you have anything better to say than just same? Anyway, can you imagine it? I think it'll be fun to kill someone. The other person asks again, who do you want to kill? Let's make a list. What the fuck? How people be having these fucking conversations? Do any of y'all motherfuckers be having these conversations? This is insane. This is fucking insane. I don't want to tell you though yet. Because you might report me to the authorities. This is all while she was living with them? Yeah. So that's... I don't really know if I believe in this whole, like, I wanted to be the only loved one. Not that that's even more what excusable, but I feel like there's a financial motive. There's something. On December 16th, six days after the murders, both Janice and Marlon were arrested. They weren't sent to jail because they're minors. They were both taken into basically like a juvenile facility. And um, Wait, so what's going on with her yes. mom? You're saying she's still talking yeah, to her? Like, what? Yeah, her mom has no idea what's going on with her. I guess the mom is like, okay, you're just off to fend for yourself. And they would just keep in contact through Facebook. So her mom Mm. was a mom. Yeah, what the fuck? Speaking of Janice's mom, she would actually meet with the McGuad parents. She would look for them and um, she ran into them at Gwyn and Louise Cemetery. So Michelle, Janice's mom, approached them and she got down on her knees and said, I'm so sorry. Every time I see their photos, I can't hold my tears back. I feel, I feel how you feel. Lavelle lifted the woman back into a standing position so that they were eye to eye and she said you don't need to kneel if only i could make you feel how painful it is but i don't have the courage to do that all i want and all i'm asking you is maybe you're the one person that can get her to tell the truth of what really happened 
Michelle Janice's mom tried to go meet with Janice, but she was not allowed to see her. Mm. So the killers were tried separately. So they were tried for the murder of Louis and for Gwen separately. One for Louis, one for um, Gwen. And when this first sentence came out, it was insane. Oh, speaking of, while they were at this juvenile center, they're provided with like activities. It doesn't even seem like prison. They're, they're going through therapy. They have activities to keep them not bored. Oh, you mean a juvenile center that actually does what fucking prison is supposed to do? Like, reform you? Huh. Wow, that's interesting. While they're at the center, Janice, for lack of a better word, she gave everyone there the creeps. She would just sit in her smell- cell quietly, never made small talk, no interest in anything, just sitting there watching everyone. The other kids there were so scared, they asked to be transferred to a different room. Jesus Christ, so the, the first fucking devil. Out, and the two killers would receive 10 years each for the murder of one Maguad sibling. So there's still another trial left, but the public and the Maguad parents, they were outraged. Uh-huh. Like, how can someone get only 10 years in prison for taking years? another life? For taking the life of a child. It said the sentence was light because in the Philippines, the criminal age of responsibility is 15. Meaning if you're younger than 15, you get no legal liability, just rehabilitation. But Janice was 17. So between the ages of 15 and 18, the criminal sentence would be rehab until they reached 18. Basically, they're going, they're going easy on them because mm. they were minors when the what crimes happened. What the fuck? Oh, that's freaking crazy. Yeah, the Maguad parents were not happy at all. Yeah, me neither. What? Neither was the public. What the hell? Cruz and Lavella, they started giving media interviews, talking to officials. They went on national TV and they just wanted to put pressure on the judicial system. Lovella admitted something really heartbreaking in these interviews. She said that because of her religion, she was actually willing to forgive Janice. Mm. She said she was trying to be understanding, and she felt like Janice in her eyes was a victim in her own life. You know, a victim of the system, a victim of circumstance, poverty, the lack of education. She's... Okay, that may be true, but you killed my children. Like, what the fuck? I don't... Listen, I'm going to be honest with y'all, bro. I am a Christian, and I don't understand how some Christians can be so, so, so forgiving. I pray that y'all have, like, you know, good fortune and everything because, you know, karma is real. But, listen, I'm a work in progress. I will forgive you, but I will, I need to make sure you get yours because what the fuck? Like, nigga, huh? Like, what? Excuse me? Like, what the fuck? said she wanted to forgive Janice. I mean, this woman is so strong. But then one day, Janice was taken into custody. And Lavella was there, and the two made eye contact. Janice was looking at the woman who gave her love and support and who treated her like her own children. She looked at the parents of her two victims, and her face was completely blank. No remorse, no guilt, not even anger or sadness or confusion, just cold indifference. And that was when Lavella changed her mind. Yeah, fuck. She said, we were so proud when we adopted Janice. Yeah. Because we thought God was using us to help this young girl. It was a blessing. Mm. But then this is what we get. Mm. Then she turned and she addressed Janice through the screen and she said, is this how you repay us after all we did for you? Does Gwen deserve this after convincing us to take you in? After seeing how little Janice cared about killing Gwen and Louis, Lavella no longer wanted to forgive Janice. I wouldn't even talk to her. I, w- I wouldn't even talk to her. I'm not even going to I wouldn't even fucking talk to her. I-, I would not. Like, no, you're not. No, what the fuck? There was a lot of um outrage sparked because of this case. You know, one of the arguments was... Recently, the age had been raised from the age of criminal responsibility had been raised from 13 to 15 in the Philippines. So a lot of people were debating that. People were debating the fact that Janice was taken in to basically CPS in the Philippines and they didn't do anything. So they said that Janice was produced as a killer by the system. Mm. Like they should have been able to support her in a way that she didn't have to kill someone, that she didn't have to end up in this situation. And another thing is, they were just kind of confused. If Janice had a mom, CPS didn't know that. And they legally let the Maguads adopt her. Like, that's crazy. So finally, the day comes. Janice and Marlon received the second sentence. And for the murder of the second Maguad sibling, both of them would receive 22 years in jail. So with this sentence and the last one combined, the killers would spend about 32 years in prison. No chance of parole. And the sentence isn't huge compared to other cases we've covered. And the Maguads weren't satisfied with the final verdict. Mm. Their children were dead, but the killers would be able to walk out of prison in their 50s. Yeah. They would have half their life left to live. <sighs> half a life that the Maguad siblings would never get to have. The Maguad parents, they went to therapy and they are in their healing process. They've opened up a restaurant in remembrance of Gwyn and Louis. Aww. They opened their doors August of 2022. 
They painted the walls like this beautiful red and yellow color and they named it Casa M&M. They serve rice dishes and even offer like a dessert bar. So now everyone that eats at this restaurant, they have a chance to experience just the love and the warmth and the compassionate nature of the Maguads. And despite all the hurt, the Maguad parents seem to be doing as best as they can be. I think they're finding a lot of strength in their community. And I just hope one day they find happiness again. And that has been the viral case of the Maguad murders. What are your thoughts? Please stay safe. I'll see you guys on Sunday for the mini-sode. Bye. Bye. Why is it always good people that are getting fucked over? Can can this like can we just get like a like like just just a just a shift in the fucking universe to just the people who do the fucking over get fucked over. And cuz this is crazy. This is crazy. This is crazy as hell. This is crazy, bro. Like man, uh rest Rest in peace to Gwen and Louie, bro. Like that shit is crazy as hell. Like you Mm, and you get and you getting out of jail, man. What the? F- I'm not even gonna say what I want to say. So I'm gonna just ask y'all, like, what are y'all thoughts? Put it in the comments. We gonna this is. Mm, I feel so bad, bro. Like, I feel so fucking bad, son. What the fuck, dude? It's always good people who get fucked over. I hate that shit so much.